我十岁的时候，呃，我和我的同伴。When I was ten, my friends and I used to drink wonderful spring water. We used to play in the locust tree groves, and we could swim in the reservoir. From 94 and 95, more seriously in 97, 98 and 99, and especially in the spring sandstorm this year, 2000, it was fierce. The sand started covering everything. In the past, there wasn't any sand here. This was all grass. It's dangerous. Sometimes the sand piles up around our door so that we can't open it. This week, Earth Report takes you to Alashan in the Mongolian Autonomous Region of China. It's an area of grassland or steppe, roughly the size of New Zealand, where the desert is growing by a thousand square kilometers per year. Ningxia is under threat. This year I even heard reports that Alashan sand is blowing all the way to Beijing. The Chinese government and international development agencies are reassessing the root causes of desertification and are undertaking large-scale efforts to address the needs of the people who live here to lessen the impact on this delicate ecosystem. One of the main objectives of the Global Environmental Facility is to preserve biodiversity. And uh, often one of the best means to preserve biodiversity is to take a large-scale ecosystem approach. So a lot of our uh, past projects in, uh, in the field of biodiversity conservation, desertification control, has been to try to provide alternative likelihood to people. To, so that rather than having to degrade the environment, they could uh, basically invest in other economic uh, activities. I want to show you two more historic houses. This is a straw bale house under construction in 1908. So the meaning is that uh, we all live in one world. So the things you do in China affect me, and the things I do in the United States affect you. Alashan, a region as important as it is remote where the people must protect scarce resources and learn from past mistakes to stop the seemingly relentless desert and draw a line in the sand. Water is the source of life, and for much of Alashan it comes from the Herlon mountain range. Now a nature reserve, the Herlon Mountains have consistently fed the plain and the aquifers below it with a steady stream of water that's vital for the capital of Alashan, Bayan Hop. Fifty years ago, there were 50 springs in the area, and three rivers flowed through Bayan Hot. On Alashan's 270,000 square kilometers, with 800 small lakes, it was very beautiful. But since 1950, the situation has completely changed. All of the springs on the plain are gone. The three rivers are dry, and of the 800 small lakes, three quarters have disappeared. What caused such a huge change in so short a time? The first reason, I think, is the increase in human activity, which has created greater pressure on the natural environment. The second reason is livestock on the grassland. Too many animals on the grassland puts too much pressure on the ecosystem. Thirdly is the poor management of water resources. 
We've wasted our water reserves. The most important reason is tree cover. The trees have been cut down. Trees are essential and the last line of defense. If the trees are destroyed, the results are disastrous. Bayan Hot sits above two underground reservoirs fed by the waters coming from the Herlon Mountains. One directly below the city was estimated to hold 700 million cubic meters of water and is now completely depleted. The other larger aquifer is still thought to contain 2.7 billion cubic meters. After years of unplanned growth and excessive water use, Officials and experts are seeking ways to limit dependence on the underground supplies. A pipeline is being built to deliver water directly from the mountains to the city, to ensure the large aquifer is not depleted, and to try to allow the already depleted one to recover. For the people living at the edges of the desert, and for the government officials whose responsibility it is to address the growing problem, the current trend is alarming. What we can say for sure is that the pace of desertification is dramatically increasing. It has almost increased by 100% since the 50s. In the war against the desert, Zhongbie Li is the ecological front line. Although the sand began to accumulate only five or six years ago, the growing desert has already overwhelmed several families, and many more are threatened. Li Shuming and his brother, Li Shuhui, both moved to Zhongbie Li more than 20 years ago, expecting to spend their whole lives here. <laughs> Along with almost all the people in Alashan, they are dependent on goat herding, which is a major factor in desertification here. I raise goats. How many goats do you have? I've got uh, more than 200. Although it is the front line, it's far from well provisioned for a prolonged battle against the sand. The local people have little understanding of the causes of desertification and are poorly prepared to combat it. There is less rain. I don't remember there ever being so little rain. Before it always rained on cloudy days, but now it doesn't. And when there is rain, it is very light. Mm. The Li family, like hundreds of others in Alashan, are preparing themselves to move to a development area. These controversial initiatives are based on the premise that the people in the region need to live on land with a consistent water supply and that unlimited grazing by goats and sheep will eventually destroy the steppe. Ah, the development areas. We would like to keep herding, but there is no room in the development areas to herd. You can only farm. There was a family there, and a family there, and one over there. It was impossible. There wasn't even any water to drink. You couldn't get a vehicle in anymore. Over there, they bought their place for 40,000 yuan, but they deserted it. There's no way to survive here, so they move to Luanjing Tan. To provide homes for those families who can no longer live on Alashan's degraded steppe, the Chinese government is relocating them to newly created development areas, like Luanjing Tan. The development areas differ little from the surrounding steppe when they are first incorporated but water, electricity and other basic services are provided by the government. The promise of land, small loans and infrastructure can be appealing for newcomers, 
when compared to the harsh life on the edge of the desert. And there's better access to employment and education. Throughout Alashan, water is the most precious resource. To provide the means to develop the marginal land in Luanjing Tan, water is being pumped from the Yellow River 70 kilometers away. Irrigation can make the desert bloom, but it puts additional strain on scarce water supplies. Although water usage is strictly measured, the long-term sustainability of these methods is very much a matter of debate. Wang Jie and his wife Guo Guishan came to Luanjing Tan six years ago when it first opened up. It was a wasteland when we first came. The wind blew every day. When we came here, there wasn't any water or electricity. Their hard work is paying off. They are farming four hectares and after living six years in very cramped conditions, are just moving into a new home. But more people come to Luanjing Tan all the time and many have lost everything to the desert. So international development agencies are helping to provide low-cost housing for those who need it most. The mission of our foundation is to help give the disadvantaged people of China more opportunities. We think this is a good project because it not only uses the straw, a waste product, but it can also help the people save money by using less energy. The Kadori Foundation is funding ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. It's providing new homes for the environmental refugees with an innovative use of an ancient building material, straw. Farmers, we don't know where. Could have been the plains of Canada, could have been uh, northern uh, plains in northern U.S. Someone somewhere decided they were going to use these big bio bricks to build a house because they lacked lumber on the plains. It turns out it worked. It worked fantastically. ADRA is one of the very few organizations uh, that is introducing Straw Bale House in the development context, where we're trying to introduce super low cost models which bring tremendous efficiencies and help people to have uh, a really nice house at a very low cost. Here in Inner Mongolia where it gets really cold is that straw bales are highly insulated. Um, they make a thick wall that really stops the cold from going through and can also in the summertime stop heat from going through. And the house, if it's designed well with, with lots of big south facing windows, passive solar, can cut down on fuel usage maybe up to 50%, depending on the climate. So what that translates into for a family is that they're using a lot less fuel and they have more money to spend on food, education, all the basic necessities of life. Fu Sheng Yan and Hu Yan were among the first to move into the straw bale houses at Luanjing Tan. The best thing is that it is our own house. Before we used to rent, and now we have our own house. We don't have to use the stove, and we are still warm, so we save coal. The second thing is straw is basically a waste product. You can see it burning even around here in this community. And so you're using a material that would normally be going up in smoke and you're putting, in, putting it into your house. So it's less expensive and it's also sustainable because straw is renewable every year. It's not like brick that takes a lot of energy to produce or wood that takes a long time to grow. For many, the idea that your house could be made largely of straw is hard to accept. But for environmental refugees like those in Alashan, Straw bale houses are one way they can get excellent, affordable shelter. And on fragile land like the grasslands on the edge of China's growing deserts, it's vital to use renewable and sustainable building materials. Wood is scarce, 
and soil for brick making is also badly needed for natural vegetation and for agriculture. Over there is watermelon. That is the corn. The wheat is in the middle. There are peanuts, peppers, yam, squash. We have everything. Sunflower. We have seven or eight crops on around nine hectares of land. Chaha Artan, one of Alashan's development areas started in the 1970s, shows the ability and determination of the Chinese to create habitable man-made oases in the desert steppe. That is all the tree barrier, and beyond are the sands. Before planting here, we had to plant the trees and make a barrier. Without this barrier, sandstorms like we had this year would have completely covered this area with sand. It would be covered with sand this thick. After 25 years, Chaha Artan looks and feels like a well-established farming community. The 2,600 people living here started out just like those in Luanjing Tan. The marginal steppe land was apportioned to landless farmers, and they were encouraged to do their best to combat the desert and build an agricultural base. The hard-working people of Chaha Artan have transformed the sparse vegetation of the steppe almost beyond recognition. But just outside the development area, the desert lurks. Uh, if, uh, if nothing is done, basically, uh, the desertification process is bound to accelerate. And uh, so there is a need for a very bold uh, intervention. The Chinese have tried many intensive measures in an attempt to halt the desert. The largest business in Alashan is the Jilan Tai Salt Lake. It employs 7,000 people and brings much needed cash to Alashan. It's crucial for the economy that the enterprise can continue. Over the years, the company has invested millions of dollars to keep the desert at bay. We've worked on this project for 18 years. We use plants including poplars, willows and specific grasses and bushes to protect our salt lake from the desert. At the present, we have planted about 1,800 hectares of trees. Our region's rainfall is quite low, just 100 millimeters per year. But the evaporation is 3,200 millimeters per year. For the trees to survive, we must use a sprinkler system and underground water supplies to water them. Mr. Yang's team of 90 people are protecting the salt lake successfully but it's hard to imagine where either the investment or the water would come from to use these active measures in the entire region. Many analysts have begun to question the long-term value of large-scale tree planting on the grasslands as a magic bullet against desertification. They consider that it is very important to understand the exact causes of desertification and to address these rather than to try to fight against the sand. At the end of the day, desertification is not a natural phenomenon. It's not something which is bound to happen. It's something which is, in most cases, policy-induced. So the importance of policy and the importance of people who are affected by these policies is critical. Pristine grassland habitats are inspirational. They are finely balanced ecosystems that have evolved over millions of years, 
with a diversity of animals, birds and plants, specially adapted to thrive on the steppe. The harsh climate and fragile soils set a natural limit on the lifestyles of traditional people who live and herd on the grassland. By adapting to a semi-nomadic existence, moving their homes and their herds when necessary, traditional pastoral use of the grassland is sustainable because the grasses are given time to regenerate. The threat is from trying to adapt the grasslands to lifestyles and agricultural systems that were designed for more temperate ecological conditions. Recent research and new development methods are helping to create a more effective framework for controlling desertification. The Chinese government, the Global Environment Facility and numerous implementation partners are all focusing on this issue. The uh, government of China, with the support of the Asian Development Bank and the cooperation of all the other uh, GEF implementing agencies, is uh, developing a program approach for sustainable land management in uh, semi-arid and arid areas. The growing desert is a daily reality for the people of Alashan. They're using straw placed in grids to stabilize individual dunes in a move to keep the sand from shifting to other, as yet unaffected, areas. People are encouraged to plant trees and shrubs. But new strategies are needed to conserve the region's natural capital. If destructive grazing is to be phased out, then herders will require education to qualify for more demanding work. This is especially important for the children of the area, who will ultimately determine its future. And Alashan could encourage a new view of its precious water supplies with active conservation measures. More effective irrigation systems that deliver water directly to the roots of a plant greatly reduce evaporation. And higher prices for agricultural water offer a greater incentive to conserve. The straw bale houses at Luanjing Tan are not only helping those who fled the desert to begin again, they are creating much needed employment and showing the world that excellent energy efficient housing can also be cheap to build. You have these big building blocks that are a waste product, and they're just so easy to stack up into a shelter. And it makes such a good shelter. It's energy efficient. It's warm in the winter. It's cool in the summer. And it's just such a direct, sustainable approach. The government policy now is to stop herding and plant trees and to stop farming and plant trees here in Alashan. The hope is that in 10 years there could be a basic turnaround in the situation. We are really uh, witnessing a paradigm shift. When you focus on policy levers rather than on the infrastructure and uh, large reforestation programs, it's very likely that you will get the result. Protecting the environment for the people here at the edge is about all that we can do. But on a bigger scale, to turn back the desert, we will need the help of the whole world for that. Although far from most people's experience, Alashan is important to humanity. 
It is in such remote and endangered ecosystems that we must address environmental degradation. For if we fail to protect these wild places now, then we will surely see the signs of collapse much closer to home, making Alashan a very important line in the sand.